Hello. I hope that you are well. I'm so glad you're here. Today, I want to talk about relationship patterns. Well, actually, I want to talk about a specific, often problematic relationship pattern. And that's this instinct to mother. Let me just break that down a little bit further. It's this urge to to pick people who need fixing, saving, or mothering, right? Let's dig into it and figure out how we can shift out of it because it's something that comes up a lot for many for many of us who identify as women. There's this <laughs> there's this allure of the fixer upper, right? How many of us have found ourselves in relationships where we are constantly playing the role of caretaker, problem solver, or maybe even a personal cheerleader, right? Look, I'm raising my hand. I that's been me so often in my life. And it's not that it's not that we necessarily like that. It's almost as if there's this like internal radar that just seeks out people who need our help, our guidance, our everything. But here's the million dollar question. Why do we do this to ourselves? Right? Why? Why do we, why do we do this to ourselves, especially if it doesn't feel good? Well, I've got some ideas. The first one is the heroin complex. There's something intoxicating about being needed, isn't there? It makes us feel important, valued, irreplaceable. It's like being the protagonist in your own romantic drama, and then you get to swoop in and save the day or your partner again and again and again, right? Then there is the familiar patterns. This is this is my this is my story. For some of us, the caretaking role feels comfortable. It's like wearing your favorite old sweater. And maybe if you're like me, you grew up in a household where you were always taking care of everything, your parents, your your siblings or whatever. You just always the responsible person. Maybe you're the most responsible person in your friend group. And so choosing a partner that needs to be mothered, that's just a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> it's just a Tuesday afternoon. Again, my story. Or maybe, maybe some of us do it to avoid our own stuff. Because if you're constantly fixing someone else, it is a great way, a fantastic way to avoid dealing with your own shit. It's just so much easier to obsess over your partner's problems than it is to face your own. Am I right? That's not an indictment, just an observation. And then the last one is just low self-esteem in disguise. Sometimes choosing someone who needs saving is just a reflection of our own insecurities. You know, like maybe we think if, if I'm helping them, they'll never leave me. Right? Ouch. But it's true. But there's a dark side to playing savior. And again, it might come off as I'm just being supportive. What's so wrong with that? And that's true to a certain extent. I mean, I'm a coach for goodness sake. I Supporting people is what I do. Right? So, so again, not an indictment, just an observation. But support, support is crucial in every relationship. But there is a fine line between support and suffocation or between helping and enabling, right? When you're constantly in savior mode, you're not actually in partnership. When you're in a parent-child dynamic, which is as sexy as a root canal, right? Like nobody wants to fuck their parent, right? So, so, so it's not attractive, but... When you are constantly mothering, that is one of the seeds of what later becomes a sexless marriage. If you are constantly mothering your partner, again, nobody wants to fuck their parent. When you are in a parent-child dynamic in a romantic relationship, this is what it can lead to. Resentment on both sides, codependency, which is very, very difficult to recover from, a loss of respect, which is very important to note because you can love someone 
But if you don't respect them, eventually the love will fizzle out. But if you respect someone, you can grow to love. So in a lot of ways, respect is more important than love. And the other thing it can lead to is burnout. Like saving the world is exhausting. It's exhausting. But then how do we break the cycle? Like how do we get out of this mothering mode? I don't want this to just be like a, a doom and gloom, you know, episode. I will, let's talk solutions. Like how do we break the pattern? How do we start choosing partners who are our equals and not our projects? So I got some tips. The first thing you want to do is get real with yourself. Maybe set aside some time to journal about your own relationship patterns, the stuff that you can see for yourself. You know, ask yourself, when was the last time you played the savior and how did it make you feel? You could also list three ways your current or past relationships mirror your childhood dynamic. You know, like for me, one of the ways... One of the consistent patterns in relationships for me has been choosing emotionally unavailable people, which, again, mirrored the dynamics in my in my parents. Finding people to save, again, chronic caretaker mirrored my childhood dynamics. That was the role I've always played. And also my value. I tied my value into how I could support people that I was in relationship with. So that's my three. So maybe just like really sitting in and looking just to list three patterns you've seen with yourself in relationships that mirror childhood dynamics. And then lastly, identify your top three fears about being in a relationship with someone who doesn't need you. What comes up when you think about being in a relationship with someone who doesn't need you? Now, I should note, need and want are two very different things, very different energies. So what would it look like if you were in a relationship with someone who wanted you but didn't need you, right? So that's the first thing, like get real with yourself. The second thing is you need to redefine support. Make a list of ways that you can support someone without taking over all of the responsibility. So how can you support somebody without making yourself responsible for their existence, right? You can also practice active listening without offering advice. Like just listen when you're talking to somebody, just listen to them. Don't don't give them advice, just hear them. Is that hard? Sometimes, I know it is for me sometimes. But you can support someone with with just listening. You don't have to do anything. And instead of asking, this is my favorite, instead of trying to fix a problem for them, ask, how can I support you? And that is something I ask often. The reason that that question is so impactful, because it shifts the other person into the mode of solution finding. And it's great if they can recruit you to be on their solution team, but they need to be the ones coming up with the ideas of what can help them get out of whatever situation they're in. So how can I support you? And the last one is just celebrating other people's growth. Acknowledge it when someone solves a problem for themselves. Like, I'm so proud of the way you handled that situation. That was great. So again, this is just a redefinition of support. The next thing you could do is set boundaries. <laughs> set boundaries like your life depends on it. <laughs> and you know, where we'd like to e- where we'd like to be going is to not have to be so rigid about boundaries all the time, right? But before you can get there, you got to have them. You have to have them. And you can start small. So the next time, you know, your partner, your husband, your spouse, or someone you're dating, the next time they face the challenge, resist the urge to jump in to fix it. Let them handle it. Ask them if you, how could you support them? But let them take the reins. The other thing is practice saying, I trust you can handle this. That way, instead of finding solutions, you're empowering them. I trust that you know you're going to figure this out. I know you are. Maybe you might need to set a a no rescue day each week, a day where you just let people figure shit out, right? 
And when you get the urge to rescue, just pause and ask yourself, is this my responsibility? And if the answer is no, and guess what? It'll mostly be no. Take a deep breath and take a step back. The fourth thing you could do to shift out of this dynamic, and this one is so important, and that's building a relationship with your inner child. I know that there's a lot of talk about inner child work in the self-help industry. That's because it's vital. So one of the things that I found helpful is writing a letter to my inner child, to my younger self, just acknowledging that their needs are valid and that they haven't always been supported, and then just offering love. So there's something potent about acknowledging the deficits and then and then letting your inner child know that you got them, that from now on you are going to be the parent that you didn't have when you were a kid. Because the reason this is important is if you really dig into it, that instinct to save, that savior complex, messiah complex, mothering complex, is really you playing out childhood experiences. Look, you, me, we, that's just us reenacting our childhood, you know, gravitating toward what's familiar. We don't have to think about how to to mother and save if that's what you grew up doing. You can do it on autopilot. And so you want to just practice when you feel overwhelmed. Practice asking yourself, what would a loving, wise parent say to me right now? And then offer that from you to you. That's how you take care of your inner child. Like, you know, you don't have to, you know, little Stacy doesn't have to be in the driver's seat anymore. She was too short anyways. Feet didn't even reach the pedals, but she was driving. <laughs> she was driving and she was driving a lot in my adulthood. But now I'm like, you know what? I am grown. I can never be abandoned again. So I don't have to I don't have to hold on too tight to relationships that don't fit. When you grow on, you can't be abandoned. You can only be left, right? It's a very different thing. As children, though, as children, your literal livelihood depends on other people. But as adults, you got access to more resources. So like playing the role of parent to your inner child so you don't have to revert back to those survival instincts that cause you to cling to other people and contort yourself into a pretzel to be everything to them, to be the the mother they didn't have. You don't have to do that. Plus, if you're busy mothering your inner child, you don't have time to be mothering everybody else. But building that relationship, crucial. The last thing is cultivating interdependence. Interdependence is very different than independence. Independence me is like, I don't need anybody. Interdependence is, I do need other people. I do need support, but I am also on my own team, right? So what does interdependence look like in a relationship for you? What does that look like? Maybe you need to also practice vulnerability, like share something that you are struggling with and allow other people to support you instead of you always being the rescuer. It's okay for someone else to support you, not rescue you. That's your own job. But it is okay for other people to support you. And, you know, also consciously looking for signs of emotional maturity and self-sufficiency in existing partners or potential partners. That's, again, another way to cultivate interdependence. You want to let them be self-sufficient. Let them take care of things themselves. They, They know how. Let them. Don't feel like you have to take over. Let them. That's how you cultivate interdependence. Letting people, trusting that people have the tools and the know-how to take care of themselves. And then also, you have to regularly assess your relationships. Are you growing together or becoming codependent? Checking in, checking in first with yourself and then checking in with the other person. You know, am I being a valued source of support for you? Am I being overbearing? Do you ever feel like, you know, like once my daughter told me, I don't need your advice all the time, mom. Duly noted. Like I had to, it was hard, 
But that's what she said because we check in and that's what she said. She didn't need me to give her advice all the time. Again, that was her telling me that allowed me to be more mindful of cultivating interdependence. So those are the five things. Let me just recap them. And this is how we are going to, you know, shift out of mothering mode. For one, we're going to get real with ourselves. For two, we're going to redefine support. Three, we're going to set boundaries. Four, we're going to build a relationship and a very intimate rapport with our inner child. And five, we're going to cultivate interdependence. So the bottom line is this. Choosing partners that we need to mother, that we feel compelled to mother or save, isn't just about them. It's about us. It's about our own needs, our own wounds, our own patterns. The good news is, once we recognize it, we can change it. You deserve a partner, not a project. You deserve someone who stands beside you, not someone who leans on you constantly. It's okay to lean a little bit sometimes, but you deserve someone who's not leaning on you constantly. And once you shift out of this mothering mindset, you open yourself up to deeper, more fulfilling relationships. Because relationships that are, again, interdependent, relationships where you have equity, where each of you has equity. So are you ready? Are you ready to retire your superhero cape and and step into uh, partnership, relationships, friendships that have that Everybody is a valued member, and it is they are interdependent, and nobody is feeling like they have to be training wheels for another person. It's a choice. It's your choice. But healthy relationships, healthy relationships don't, you don't have to play a parent in, in a healthy romantic relationship. You get to be a grown-up, and the other person gets to be a grown-up too. You're not here to save anyone. Because love is, <laughs> love is building something beautiful together, something that is fulfilling, something that nurtures us, something that pours into us, but not something that we have to sacrifice ourselves for. I love you. <laughs>